Well, let's, uh, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 14. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings at the end of the service. Uh, you may be seated, but uh, I just wanted to go over this scripture again that we looked at this last Sunday. And I do believe that the first time you see anything mentioned in the Bible, it's an important hallmark for us. And um, here's the first mention of someone who knew the Lord giving to the Lord. In verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem or Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high, and he blessed him. This is speaking of Abram, and here's what he said to him. Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. So two blessings are mentioned here. First of all, blessed be Abram, and you'll notice it says of God most high, indicating that Abram belonged to God. And so just by virtue of belonging to God, he's blessed. And then he describes the God whom Abram belonged to as the possessor of heaven and earth. Everything belongs to God. Not every person belongs to God, but Abram belonged to God because he had faith in God. And then the second blessing is towards God. He says, and blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so Melchizedek was now giving this blessing to God, and he calls him here most high. He's the most high God. There's no one higher than God. He's the Lord of lords, and he's the king of kings. And he mentions what God had done for Abram. It was God who had delivered your enemies into your hands. And you'd have to read the first part of chapter 14 to appreciate what that meant. But imagine uh, your family members being abducted, taken away out of your care against your will and your inability to rescue them, but then to have someone come and rescue them and deliver them back to you. And that's exactly what God did. God rescued Abram's uh, family by delivering the enemies into your hand. And then the response on Abram's part is listed at the last part of verse 20. It says, and he gave him a tithe of all. And so here, without any coercion, uh, without any r even real instruction, you find Abram demonstrating his love for God, his worship of God, and giving to God a tithe. And so uh, as you give to the Lord, uh, you're giving to the Lord because of his blessings in your life. If you count your blessings and name them one by one, there's a lot of them. And God is your deliverer. And so uh, we'll receive the tithes and the offerings at the end of the service. But let's turn to the book of Romans, please, chapter 1, as we begin now our study from Romans to Revelation. And we finished the last book in the Old Testament last Wednesday night. And... Uh, here we now have the blessing of beginning this epistle of the book of Romans. And if you wouldn't mind standing for a moment as we read a few verses. Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David 
according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead through whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. We thank you for the grace that you have extended to us. And we thank you for the peace of God that we have in our lives and can have. And we thank you, Father, that there's peace with God that can be made. And for many of us, that peace with God, our salvation, we possess that. And then, Lord, as your children, we thank you that you can give us the peace of God. And so as we begin our journey now through the New Testament, and in particular here in Romans, we ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit might enable us to see the truth of your word. And we ask, Lord, that that same Holy Spirit would also give to us a clear understanding of your word, that we might not just see it, but we would understand it. And then, Lord, we ask that you would help each of us personally to not merely be seers and understanders of your word, but that we would be doers of the word of God. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit would give us his power and give us personal resolve to be committed Christians. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, Paul opens his letter, which deals with the doctrine of justification. And this is the great uh, explanation by the Apostle Paul on how a person can be saved why we need to be saved, how we can't be saved, and how we can be saved, and what we do as saved people. And so he introduces himself in chapter 1, verse 1, by calling himself a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. So three things that he mentions right off the bat in his little introductory note to the Christians at Rome, describing himself, first of all, as a servant. And that word servant is literally the word slave, and it's from a word that means to bind. And it's speaking of the believer who voluntarily takes the position of slave to Christ, being a slave to Christ, having no rights or will of his own, he does always and only the will of his master. So that's how Paul regarded himself as a person living for Christ, uh, picking up his cross, denying himself and following Jesus Christ. From God's perspective, what God does is he also binds himself to his slaves and he cares for his slaves. He is concerned for them and it's his responsibility to care for them. And so Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, and in his service to Christ, he had been called to be an apostle or a messenger of Christ and thirdly, he was separated to the gospel or the good news of Jesus Christ. And he goes on now in his introduction to begin talking about the gospel. He says in verse 2, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Having just completed the Old Testament, we know of the 
multitude of references to the Messiah. And all through the Old Testament, the promise of the first coming and the second coming of Christ uh, is there. God's promises, of course, are always accomplished. And so he had not only promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, but of course he fulfilled his promises. And by the way, every promise that God makes and when you stop and think for a moment, you think, what is the definition of a promise? What does it mean when someone promises to do something? Uh, for instance, we have what are called promissory notes, which means that you promise that you're going to pay the money that you owe the person or group from which you borrowed the money. It's a promissory note. You're making a, a uh, commitment to do something. When, and it's the same thing with the Lord. When he makes a promise, he's faithful to accomplish his promises. And here is Paul, hundreds and hundreds of years after these promises had been made, the Lord had come, Paul had become a Christian, and now through the Holy Spirit, he's beginning to explain to us and to the believers in Rome concerning Jesus Christ. It's concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. So uh, Jesus, as a man, came down through the lineage of King David, but as God, he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So he was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. He descended from David but he was declared to be the Son of God or designated. Jesus was designated or proved to be the Son of God by his own resurrection from the dead. That was the proof positive that he was the Son of God. Through whom, in verse 5, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name or on behalf of his name. And so all of the blessings that we receive come through Christ, and he's identifying that here in the fifth verse, saying, through whom, and it's the same for you and I, the blessings we've received have come through Christ. Paul says, we have received grace, the unmerited favor of God, and apostleship. So he's identifying the source of the favor in his own life and the function within his own life, again, that of apostleship. It was something that he had received from God. It had come to him, and there was a purpose for his function. There was a purpose for his being an apostle. It was for the benefit of other people for obedience to the faith among all nations. And so God's purpose is to get the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ out through gifted men and through the body of Christ to all nations, as we saw um, recently, uh, the gospel being preached to all of the nations. And saw that in Mark here just recently uh, concerning the end of the the age that uh, the end of the age will come when the gospel has been preached to all of the nations. In verse 6, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ or those who have been summoned by God to salvation. Now we get what are called jury summons in the mail and um, when you get them you go, oh, and uh, you immediately start thinking of why you can't go even before you open it up, which is not a very good indication of our duty as citizens. But what's happening is we're being summoned by an authority. And there's a, there's a summons, you're, you're being summoned. And so Paul is describing our salvation as that of having been called of Jesus Christ. So.
uh, he recognized that it was the Lord who had summoned him. And God is the one who has called you into his kingdom. He's called you, you're the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. We could change that a little bit and say to all who are in Visalia or to all who are listening to this on the radio in uh, maybe Indiana or Texas or Tennessee or uh, Delaware or wherever this program may be airing. Um, to all who are in Rome, notice, beloved of God and called to be saints. So two things there. One, beloved of God. And this is, of course, the central theme of the heart of God. And it's expressed for us in the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. And all of the Christians in Rome, just like all of the Christians here, are loved of God. And then secondly, called to be saints. And the word saints means to be set apart to God for his exclusive use. Going back to the idea of Paul being a servant, wasn't original with him. Jesus, of course, is the prime example of being a servant. And he said, I am among you as one that serves. And we're being transformed into the image of Christ. And Christ came here, and by his own uh, word and his own explanation, he said, I'm here to do the will of my Father. I'm committed to doing what my Father wants me to do. And Paul had come to that same position in his life after having been converted. He dedicated himself to the Lord and wanted to do the will of God. And to be a saint speaks of your position that God has actually set you apart. The, the word literally means holy ones or set apart ones. So... Um, Part of the enjoyment of the Christian life, beyond the joy of knowing that you're saved, is the joy of living out the purpose that God has called you for. And so God has set you apart. And Christians who actually live their lives with that in mind, and by grace and by God's power, they seek to follow Jesus Christ are actually the happiest people on the face of the earth. And uh, because they're doing what God has set them apart to do. God has set you apart to be his child and to serve him. He closes out his little, um, his little introduction here by saying, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, a very common salutation by Paul the Apostle. You find it in almost every one of his epistles. Sometimes he'll add the word mercy, but here he says, and it's really a prayer, he says, here are two things from God to you. First of all, grace. And what does the word grace mean? Well, mean. It means what you do as fast as you can before you eat. No, it doesn't mean that. Uh, the word grace means undeserved, unmerited favor. Undeserved, unmerited favor. And so he's saying God's undeserved, unmerited favor to you. He's reminding them of the fact that God is gracious. He's reminding them of this truth that we don't deserve the blessings of God, but God wants to bless our lives. That's just who he is. And so grace to you, and then peace to you. Another spiritual reality that we can have in our lives that fits so nicely 
into the crevices of the pain that is so often in our hearts and into our lives when we need the peace of God. There is something called the peace of God, and it's what brings about that calmness and that joy in our lives when we're able to believe God and entrust ourselves to God. What he does is he gives us peace. And these come, as he says here at the end of verse 7, they come from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Paul was delighted and he was so thankful to God for the fact that the faith of these believers in Rome, whom he'd never met, by the way, he hadn't ever been there. He wrote this letter from Corinth intending to go to Rome, but he appreciated the fact that they had faith, and he's identifying the fact that their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. Uh, we don't even know who the first uh, Christians were that went to Rome. We don't know who first brought the gospel to Rome, who first started, who started the first little church in Rome, or the uh, little house churches, no doubt, is what they were. Uh, we don't really know how the gospel came there, but it did come there. And people there in Rome, many of them in a very, very pagan society, received the gospel of Christ and their lives were transformed and they were living the Christian life. And as a result of that, their faith was spoken of throughout the whole world. People knew about them. And he was so thankful for that. In verse 9, he says, For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. So God was Paul's witness, and he was the witness of a couple of things. He says, God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit, in the gospel of his son, and here was the main thing that God was a witness of, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, I wish I could say that. I wish I could say that about you. You probably wish you could say that about anybody. Uh, we all wish that we were more inclined to be people who prayed and to have consistent prayer lives. And Paul is really an example for us here of the fact that people can have these kinds of prayer lives. And in his prayers, God was the witness of his prayer. You know, Jesus said, don't make a big show of your prayers, but you go into your closet and close the door, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So he said, uh, nobody may know about the fact that I pray, but he said, God is my witness. And when I'm praying, I'm making mention of you. So here we see one of the things that he prayed about was that he made mention of the Romans, the Roman believers. He would bring them before God. And in our prayers, for example, uh, even at, at your 
time just over your meal, a quick prayer. You can make mention of your church and, and, and uh, bring the church here at Calvary Chapel before God and uh, ask the Lord to bless. His specific request to God was in verse 10, making request, if by some means now at last I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. Paul was not one to make demands upon God, nor should you or I ever put ourselves in a place where we're telling God what he ought to do for us. Uh, Paul said, I'm making my request. I'm just, I have a desire, but I'm, I'm just leaving it with him. And the request was, if by some means, Lord, if there's some way, he, even the great apostle Paul didn't know how would it work, when would it happen, how would it come about. But he said, if by some means, now at last, which in tells us that he had wanted to do this for some time, he said, I may find a way in the will of God to come to you. I long to come and see you, he says in verse 11. He really wanted to go see them, and the purpose of his wanting to go see them is listed for us in verse 11, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. So uh, Paul wanted to exercise the spiritual gifts that God had given him for the benefit of those saints in Rome. He says that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. And here we see a couple of things. One is that the reason the Lord gives people gifts, which of course he's given you gifts, is he wants you to use your gifts so that in the using of your gifts, the effect that it has upon other people is it helps to establish them, to get established and to be strengthened. And as you use your spiritual gifts, the net result, if there's an open and a receptivity on the other side, is that there will be an establishing or a strengthening. And that was Paul's desire. He explains it a little bit more in verse 12. He says, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. So. The purpose of our ministry is that of encouragement. The purpose of ministry ought to be that of encouragement. The purpose of our ministry ought to be that of helping to establish one another in our mutual faith. He said, I don't want you to be unaware that I often planned to come to you. I tried to come to you many times, worked out my plans, but was hindered until now. He doesn't tell us exactly how he was hindered, although we do know uh, that he wound up being arrested, he wound up going in prison, he also wound up shipwrecked, and he had all kinds of different problems. But here is a fact of life in Paul's life that um, his plans didn't always work out the way he wanted them to. In fact, some of the reasons, one of the reasons why his plan didn't work, plans didn't always work out the way he wanted to, is that he was hindered. There was something that was like a log across the road making his ability to pass through impossible. So even the great apostle Paul had difficulty in accomplishing the things that he wanted to. The purpose of his visiting them is further described for us in verse 13 that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among the other Gentiles. He knew that wherever he went and however he exercised his gifts, that what happened was it not only caused an establishment and an encouragement in the life of other people, but it brought forth fruit in their life. And this is the purpose of Jesus Christ in our lives, that we would be fruitful. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is the primary expression, the primary fruit that God wants to bring is that fruit of our love for God, our love for one another, 
There are other examples of fruit that are given to us throughout the New Testament. Our worshiping of God by singing is considered to be fruit. God considers that fruit, if you stop and think about it, when a human being who had no relationship with God was uh, a law-breaking, pagan, sinful, uh, worthy of judgment person, yet rescued by the mercy of God, born again, transformed, adopted into the family of God, made a joint heir, given the gift of eternal life, uh, when that person then vocalizes from their heart, praising the Savior who saved them and, and acknowledging by song, by words, from their heart, all of the glorious attributes of God, that is a very fruitful thing. That's a very fruitful thing as compared to the person who's going around cursing God and, and uh, trying to diminish the faith of God and in God and so on and so forth. So God considers your singing to be fruit. So uh, when you come and you have an opportunity to sing, please recognize that even if you don't sing well, God thinks you do. We know you don't. No, no, I'm just kidding. But it is indeed fruit, isn't it? It is indeed fruit. There used to be a, a lady in our church, she doesn't attend here anymore. Um, and she used to sing way off key. She used to sit right over there. And she would sing loud, loud, and passionately to the Lord. And um, in some senses, I'm glad she isn't here anymore. You know, I mean, you understand what I'm saying. I, I had to kind of finish that thought up a little bit and just trying to get out of this hole I've dug myself in. You know, the book of Proverbs says, if you dig a hole, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fall right in it. Well, I, I'm always digging. I've got shovels. I dig holes all the time. But here's the, what I'm trying to encourage you with is she really just worshiped the Lord, you know, and, and off key and all of that. But from God's perspective, it was fruit. And uh, that's one of the things. Secondly, your service to Christ is considered fruit. When you serve the Lord, that's fruit. Your involvement in the winning of souls is considered fruit. Your involvement in the expansion of the gospel, missions, that's considered fruit. Your financial support of the work of God, these are all biblically defined for us as fruit. And so Paul said, I want to have fruit among you. I want to see you praising God. I want to see you serving God. I want to see you involved in getting the gospel of Christ out. I want to see you involved in evangelism. I want to see you involved in, in worshiping God and, and giving to the Lord. And so these are the plans of God for your life. Um, and Paul had a very fruitful ministry and he wanted to have, have it there in Rome. He also described himself as a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and unwise, those who spoke the Greek language, and in contrast to the barbarians who uh, had not actually adopted that culture, the educated, the uneducated, he said, I'm just a debtor to everybody. And then he said, so as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. Paul was ready to go. He was loaded up, fired up, ready to go. And he said, as much as is in me, in other words, I'm totally committed to the thing that God has called me to do. And in his case, along with being an apostle, he was called to be a preacher and he wanted to come to Rome and to preach the gospel to Rome and see other people come to Christ. He explains that desire to preach in verse 16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Here's why. 
for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul was not ashamed of the good news of Christ. And, and again, the gospel of Christ is the simple fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again on the third day. That's the gospel of Christ. He said, I'm not ashamed of it. And he said, not only am I not ashamed of it, but I understand something about the gospel of Christ that is unlike anything else in life. The gospel is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Anyone who will believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ will be saved whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Greek. In describing the gospel, he says in verse 17, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith or on the principle of faith, faith from start to finish. The righteousness of God means the restoration of right relations between man and God that proceeds from God's gift through his son. That's what is in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the restoring of a right relationship between man and God through faith in Christ. We don't have that right relationship naturally. We don't have the relationship, but it's through the gospel of Christ that we come into that right relationship. And it's from faith to faith, from start to finish, from the beginning of the gospel, going all the way back in the Old Testament, it's always been by faith, it always will be, and our lives are called to be by faith, walking by faith. And what Paul is emphasizing here is that a person can be righteous in God's sight only by faith. There's no other way that you can come into a right relationship with God. You can't buy it. You can't make yourself right. You can't wish yourself right. You can't come up with some new idea and present it to God. And he said, well, no, I hadn't thought of that. That might work. There's really just one way, and that's by faith. That's by simply trusting in the person of Jesus Christ. And for those of you who have trusted in Christ as your Savior, you are now justified. You're in right relationship with God. You're at peace with God. Now, what he does from here through the next couple of chapters is he explains why it is that people need to be saved. He's just really mentioned the fact of salvation, but now he begins to speak about the Gentiles who need to be saved, and then he speaks about the moralists or the Jews who need to be saved, and he winds up in the third chapter by saying, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But he explains the uh, need for salvation and the cause of condemnation. Why is it that people need to be saved? Well, it's because of their own willful ignorance of God. He says, for the wrath of God, or the judgment of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest or evident in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile or empty in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools 
and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So God's judgment, it is coming from heaven, and it's against two things, ungodliness and unrighteousness, two different things. Unrighteousness is, first of all, the way that people treat one another that is not in a loving way. It's an unrighteous way. Ungodliness is when people don't treat God the way that they should treat God. So the people who will ultimately experience the judgment of God are the people who don't love others and who don't have a relationship with God. They will one day experience the wrath or the judgment of God. And he says in the last part of verse 18 that of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness or hold down the truth in the wrong way of living. In other words, they know what the truth is, but they're holding it down. They're, they're not allowing the truth to dominate and lead their lives. Because what may be known of God, verse 19, is manifest or evident in them, for God has shown it to them. God has shown men himself, and men choose to willfully ignore what God has shown them. They suppress it. We talk about suppressing things, pushing them down. Right from the beginning of creation, the invisible attributes of God, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his eternal nature, all of those things are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. All men know that there is a God. And the reason that they know there is a God is because God has shown them. He has made it evident to them. And he's done it, really, uh, one of the ways he has revealed himself is through creation. Verse 21, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile or empty in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And so here, further describing the fact of the suppression of the knowledge of God, he says that although they knew that God exists, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were they thankful to him. And instead of glorifying God or living for God, instead of being thankful to God, they became futile or empty in their thoughts. So our thoughts ought to actually be filled with glorifying God. Our thoughts ought to actually be filled with being thankful to God. And when a person isn't that way, what happens is their foolish hearts become darkened. There's a consequence to rejecting God. We've just studied that all through the Old Testament. And the consequence is described as their foolish hearts being darkened Furthermore, in verse 22, professing to be wise, they became fools. What an interesting statement. And here's what they did. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. And so the worship of nature the worship of animals. And as you go around the world and look at different cultures, uh, I mean, you could just pick them. I'm not, and, and you could pick on any one of the ones that you could pick on and just pick them out and say, oh yeah, uh, they worship this, uh, these animals, or they worship, you can go to India, they worship cows. Or you can go to California where they worship, some people worship trees. I mean, uh, it's worshiping nature instead of worshiping God. Now, the result of that uh, 
changing and of that worshiping of the creation, there's a further consequence listed in verse 24. So this is like a descending scale. Therefore, God also gave them up. So when people give up God and refuse him and suppress the knowledge of God and turn it all around into worshiping something else, there's a consequence there as well. And that consequence is that God gives people up. He lets them go. So therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness. So the, the result of the rejection of God is that people begin to become unclean morally. Unclean, uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So you have here this indictment of the world showing why man needs the righteousness of God. Man is condemned because the truth that was given to him and because he by his actions has rejected God. And so men begin to dishonor their bodies. And so you begin to see the, the way that people misuse their bodies is the result of rejecting God. In verse 25, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And that lie, of course, is the one that's been made up. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, and again, Paul repeats it, for this reason of the exchanging of the truth of God for the lie and worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. And so now Paul begins to describe the issue of both female and then male homosexuality. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over. Now a third time, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting or are improper. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning or without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So Paul is laying out the doctrine of salvation by first of all showing why it is that people need to be saved and the reason people need to be saved, especially Gentiles, in their case, he describes it because they are rejecting the truth of God. And when people reject the truth of God, he'll give them up to uncleanness, he'll give them up to vile passions, and he'll give them up to a debased mind. And so when you see people who are given up to uncleanness or walking in vile passions or have a debased mind, it's because they've rejected God and God has allowed them to just go their way. 
Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Now what he does is he shows the condemnation of the moralist or the Jew or the religious person. Not only is the Un, the pagan in need of salvation, but the religious Jews were as well. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So here, now speaking of the inexcusability of the person who judges another person, because in judging another person of a particular fault, he's saying you're condemning yourself because as you judge that person, you are also practicing the same thing. You're doing something. And our judgment isn't like God's. The, the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. When we, we, you know, that's why the Bible says don't judge because we don't really know what's going on in a person's heart or life. God does. And then he says, do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? You know, the Jews were ones who expressed their judgment against adultery. Jesus said, you've heard that a man shall not commit adultery. But he said, I'm saying to you, if you look at a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery. So if you're judging somebody for doing something and you're doing the same thing, do you think you'll escape the judgment of God? There is no, you can't escape the judgment of God. Or do you, and he's asking these questions, do you think you'll escape the judgment of God or do you despise the riches of his goodness? Now he turns the argument here from talking about what men do to talking about who God is and that men can actually despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent or unrepentant heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things contained in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So this is quite a chapter <laughs> and a, a, a huge long sentence. And so do you think you'll escape the judgment of God? That's one. 
Or do you despise his goodness? Do you despise his forbearance and his long suffering? Don't you know that it's God's goodness that leads you to repentance? And then he says, beginning in verse 5, but because of the hardness of your heart, your unwillingness to repent, what you're doing is you're treasuring up, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So as a person goes through their life, refusing the goodness of God, refusing him, they're building up a pressure that is one day going to be unleashed against them when the judgment of God comes against them. And God will render, in verse 6, to each one according to his deeds. In the time of judgment, God's judgment will be fair. Each one will be judged according to his deeds. And there's two categories here. First of all, eternal life, verse 7, to those who, by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. The persons who walk with God, the persons who want to live with God, not that they're saved by their works, but in describing the follower of Christ, what God is going to render to you is eternal life. If you follow Jesus Christ, God's going to render to you eternal life. He'll render to you uh, honor and immortality. That's your future. But to those who are self-seeking, they don't want the will of God. They want to do their own will. They do not obey the truth. They don't obey Christ. But they obey unrighteousness. They live the wrong way. What will be rendered to them will be indignation and wrath tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, both of the Jew and of the Greek. But getting back to those who follow the Lord, glory, this is what's waiting for you. Honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. And so, Those who've sinned without law, people who, non-Jews, they never had the law of God, they'll also perish without the law of God. And as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. The Jews who have the law will be judged by it. It's not those, he says, it's not the hearers of the law that are just in the sight of God, but it's the doers of the law who will be justified. In other words, for the Jews in particular, and then for religious people, you could make the application, it isn't for people who hear God's word and who even have a belief in it that are going to be saved, but it's people who are actually living it. In other words, it's for the persons who've actually been saved and been born again. No one can ever keep the law perfectly. But there's a vast difference between people who, who hear the law, they hear the word of God, but they don't live it. And, and of course, these are, this is a concept that we're familiar with in describing when we talk about Christians and nominal Christians and people we know what they know about the truth, but they don't really live the truth. I mean, when you ask somebody you know, especially if it's uh, they've, someone's died and you didn't know them, you say, well, did they know the Lord? And many times they'll say, oh, yes, they sure did. And your heart is immediately just relieved. Or they'll say, well, I'm not sure. They went to church, but I'm not sure. And so a lot of people go to church, a lot of people hear the word, but it's those who are doers of the word. And so he even uses the example in verses 14 and 15 of the Gentiles who they've never been given the law of God, but they're doing the things that are contained in the law. These, although not having the law, are a law to themselves. They're They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, 
and between themselves and their thoughts, accusing or else excusing. People know what is right and what is wrong, even if they've never had the law of God. And the reason is because God has imprinted his law upon the heart of every man. You can go to the furthest region in the world and find people who've never had any contact with the civilized world, and they know it's wrong to murder. They know it's wrong to take another man's wife. They know it's wrong to tell a lie. They know it's wrong to steal. They've never had a Bible. They've never had a preacher. Where in the world did they get this idea? Or you can go to that same place and you can find people admiring good character and they'll say, well, yes, he's a good man. He, he minds his own business. He's a good man. He's faithful to his wife and his family. He's a good man. He doesn't steal. He works hard and he's not a cheater. And he's a good man because he tells the truth. They're either approving of one another's behavior or they're excusing it, making up even then, well, it's okay as people change the laws of society to bring some sense of peace to their guilty minds. And then really bearing down on the Jew even further in verse 17, he says, indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. In other words, because of the fact that the Jews professed to be the people of God but lived like pagans, the pagans blasphemed God by the way that the Jews were living. And of course, the same thing happens today in our culture. People will say, oh, those Christians, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. And, and they mean it. What they don't realize is they have the same problem. But they're, they're actually putting their finger on something. They're saying, you know, the people who profess to know God, they're not genuine. They're not really living the way that they preach. We like to use that term, practice what you what? Practice what you preach. And so when, when the church does practice what it preaches, when we do live with God, when we do repent, and when we do obey Him, and when we do follow Him, and when we do repent and decide to always go His way, what happens is we become a, an effective light and a tool in the hands of God, and, and people at least aren't going to level that criticism of hypocrisy at us. They're, they're, they have other things they'll say about us but they certainly can't say that. And so the integrity in your life, it's a powerful thing. And if you're teaching somebody, don't you teach yourself? Yes, you sure do. When I'm teaching the Bible, I'm, I'm not just teaching you. I'm teaching myself as well. And when I read the Bible and it says, do this, I'm saying to myself, am I doing that? If the Bible says don't do that, I'm saying to myself, am I doing that? Am I dishonoring God by breaking his law? And it, and it is a dishonor to God to break his law. In verse 25, he says, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision is 
has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Yes. And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Yes, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew or a person of God who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not from men but from God. Circumcision, an odd topic to be discussing, but a very important biblical topic, was, a, was part of the covenant and the sign that God gave to his people. The cutting away of the male flesh as a symbol that I'm no longer going to be a person who lives by my flesh or my own way. I'm cutting the flesh away. I'm cutting away my self-lived living life, my flesh-dominated life, the lust of my flesh, and I'm going to live for you. So circumcision was, it's, for us, we would call it baptism. And you could, you could say, well, baptism is a sign that I'm no longer living the way that I used to live. I used to live without God. I used to live for myself. And I used to live and do this and do whatever I wanted to do. But I've changed now. I've been born again. I've identified with Christ. I belong to him. And that old life is down under the water. I'm a new person as I come up, and I'm now living a spirit-led life. I want to live for God. And so his question there in verse 25, he says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. That, that right, that outward right, it's as if it never happened. And then he poses this argument. He says, look, if an uncircumcised person keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? The answer would be yes, from God's perspective. Will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? Yes. He's not a Jew who is one outwardly. It's not the outward things that we do, but nor is it that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. It isn't what you've done to circumcise yourself, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart. So it begins in the heart. You know, we can come to church, as it were, and we can put on the dog. We can put on the, the, you know, the outward trappings of being a Christian and act like a Christian. But then in our private life, away from fellowship, in our hearts, we're given over to the lusts of our mind and of our flesh, and we live an entirely different life. So the person who really is a person of God isn't the one with the outward show. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is that of the heart. So it's the cutting away in our heart. I'm not going to live a flesh-dominated life. I'm not going to be a hateful person. I'm not going to be an unloving person. I'm not going to be an adulterous person. I'm not going to be a thief. I'm not going to be a, a whisperer, a backbiter, a hateful person. I'm not going to do those things. I'm not going to steal. I'm making those decisions in my heart. That's where the real issues are. So he says that it's the circumcision that is of the heart in the spirit, 
and not in the letter whose praise is not from men but from God. And so his point here in these two chapters is that everybody needs to be saved. The pagans need to be saved because they've rejected God. Look at the way they live. Look at the way they worship. Look at the moral decline. And by the way, just as a little thought, you can go back over chapter 1. When a society is... When society lives the way that it is described in Romans chapter 1, it's because God has given them over. So when you look at our society today and the way that our society is living, it's because God has given our society over to uncleanness. That's why it's so dirty. God has given our society over to the lusts of the flesh. That's why it's so lustful. God has given our society over to a debased mind to do all of these kinds of things. God is being pushed, has been pushed out, legislated out, criminalized for being a Christian. And there are consequences. And we need the Lord. People need to have salvation. But then for the religious person, who is really only a religious person outwardly and, and passes judgments about, oh, you know, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. He says, well, are you doing those things? And if you are doing those things, do you think you'll escape the judgment of God? And it's not the person who's outwardly religious. It's the person who's actually living the life. And you say, well, wait a minute. Nobody can really live that life. Exactly. We need to be saved, and we need God to live his life in and through us. He will fulfill the righteous standard. We need a Savior who is righteous. We need to be in Christ so that we can be accepted. And then what God does is he works in our life to help us to day by day be his disciple, to learn from him and to put off the things of our flesh and to live a spirit-led life. And that spirit-led life is like the, the life that the children of Israel lived when they went into the promised land and they were victorious. As long as they went with God, they were victorious. When they pushed God out of their life, they, they suffered. And so we could never live well enough to be saved, so God has done that. Christ lived well enough. He lived perfectly. He is perfect. And when we receive him, we're put in him. And so when God looks at Christ, guess who he sees in the body of Christ? Guess what he sees? He sees those who are in the body of Christ. You become placed into the body of Christ. You have the righteousness of Christ imputed to you. So when God sees Christ, he sees you perfectly. You're in him who is perfect. And in our life between the time we're saved and the time we're raptured or die and go to heaven, we struggle learning how to not do the things that we used to do or still are tempted to do and don't want to do. God helps us with that. He teaches us how to walk in the Spirit. He teaches us how to take the hand of God, as it were, and let God's Holy Spirit lead us in the right direction and to find from the Holy Spirit power to live the right way. And then we have a blessed life. We have a happy life. And so there's, there's a freedom that we have. We're free from ourselves. The, the, corruption that, the corruption that can bring you down, it's just right there. But we're no longer subject to it. We don't have to live in it. People who are not saved, are, they are... They are mastered by corruption. There's no escape for them. 
They try every which way to be better people, and they're unsuccessful. And even if they're the nicest people in the world, they're still breaking the laws of God. So Paul's laying out, he's beginning to lay out the argument that people need to be saved. And what he begins to do in the third chapter, which you'll be happy to know we're not going to get into tonight, because this is a lot of stuff here. But in the third chapter, he begins to explain how you cannot be saved. And then he goes on to explain how you can be saved. And then he goes on to explain, now that you are saved, this is how you can live. So this is a great book, and we're way over our time. Once again, you've taken us over our time. My, 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 shame on you. I'm so sorry. I didn't realize how much time. I was at a pastor's conference last night, and... Two of these pastors said, oh, I can see I've only got 17 minutes left in my message. They went 35 minutes over. And we're sitting around saying, how can these guys not stay on time? I know. (laughs) Don't mean to do it, but it does happen. Ushers, if you'll run up here, and we'll do a speed offering here, okay? Uh, Let's stand together, and uh, the ushers are going to give you that opportunity to be like Abram and to worship the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the book of Romans, and it's certainly a mouthful. It's a lot to think about. Basically, you're the only one who can help us really understand it. And do bless, Lord, as we go through the New Testament, these wonderful epistles, and and give us that understanding we need. And Lord, like Abram, you've blessed us, and we've We are thankful, Lord, that you have delivered us, and we thank you that you continue to deliver us, and we want to love you. We do love you. And this evening, Lord, as we uh, read all of these penetrating truths from the Bible, we would just simply in humility say, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, and we just ask, Lord, that you would take us, that you would shape our thinking and set us free where we need to be set free and lead us, guide us, bless us. Lord, you're the teacher. You've called us to be disciples, to learn of Jesus Christ and to observe your ways. And so, Father, we thank you for that wonderful summons that you've given to us, this wonderful calling into life itself. Fill us, we pray, with the Holy Spirit. And Father, we ask that you would receive from us your tithe tonight. And we we bring it to you as worshipers. In the name of Christ, We pray, and may I also say in the bulletin, our announcements, I believe this evening is the last time you can buy tickets for the special uh, Trendsetters Ice Cream Social, which is open to the church on Saturday. You can do that out in the uh, lobby area. So let's worship, and then we'll be dismissed.